Welcome to the show. My guest today is Joe Klimovich, the Managing Director of the Federal CIO Advisory Practice at KPMG. Joe, always a pleasure to catch up and welcome to the program. Thanks, Jason. It's uh, very, glad, very glad to be here again with you. Thank you. Today, we're going to talk about the shifting priorities for agency chief information officers, specifically amid the coronavirus pandemic. Agency CIOs have uh, realized the importance not just of IT modernization, but all those pieces that makes those efforts successful, such as cloud and hybrid cloud, and application and rationalization and the use of technology business management framework to better understand the cost structures of IT. Now, my guest today, Joe Klimovich, has been this, a CIO. You've been in that position. You're at the Justice Department for six years. You're the vice chairman of the CIO Council for two years. You got to see firsthand how these priorities shifted and then how to adjust to those ever shifting priorities and, of course, be successful. So let's just start with the beginning, Joe, because I think this is the most important question. What are those strategic imperatives CIOs are focusing on today, given the need for greater resilience, improved uh, and increased remote work and, and the ever changing mission requirements? Thanks, uh, Jason. Um, when you look at the big picture, uh, digital technology today is ubiquitous. Uh, digital collaboration is uh, woven into everyday life. Uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, they're available at your fingertips and they're fueled by just staggering volumes of data uh, that are generated by billions of interconnected uh, devices. Uh, most of those are mobile. But when you look at the pandemic, it has created uncertainties in service delivery, supply chain, and employee engagement. And taking all this into consideration, I really see five strategic imperatives for CIOs. The first is uh, manage IT as a business. Uh, funds are, are always required for big transformations. But yet, when you look at it, uh, roughly 80% of the federal IT spend goes to O&M. The other thing is making sure that you have accurate and good cost information for your services and products. TBM, as you mentioned, certainly can help in that area. Procurement spend optimization to include licensing and rationalizing applications, freeing up funds for, for modernization. Uh, I think moving uh, as much on-prem work to commercial cloud environments as you can is a good business investment. And then really take a look at hard look at uh, managed services. Everything is a service is being offered out there. Number two is automate at scale and embrace new technology. Automate everything uh, you can using low code or no code platforms. Um, you know, developing effective strategies to bring data and analytics and compute together. And don't overlook 5G because 5G has the, the, the opportunity to, to really change a lot of the ways we uh, we communicate the way we uh, deliver services. Number three would be to simplify IT for consistent user experience. Now, Forrester did a, a survey of 700 plus executives in the May to July timeframe. And when you look at it, pre-pandemic, customer centricity was a, a key focus uh, for 80% of the organizations. But um, the pandemic is pushing customer centricity even higher and up the priority uh, uh, stack. Um, more than half the respondents of their accelerating initiatives around employee experience to better deliver value. Uh, this, these are key things. The, the UX, the CX are really important for, for corporations. It's, to boil it down, it's make it simple, fast, uh, use natural language uh, queries, highly personalized, and making sure that your services learn over time. The fourth area I would say is protect your environment, protect your enterprise, but maintain agility. Um, look, your, your workforce is offsite. Your IT should be offsite, should be in a cloud environment. And that creates uh, challenges for cybersecurity, but I think cybersecurity must need to change. No longer do we have the traditional network uh, defense. Um, and so that network, a traditional network defense doesn't allow you to take advantage of the agility that you see in cloud really need to, to evolve our, our security architecture to zero trust. Um, identity management becomes huge um, going forward and supply chain, both well from products, services and, and companies, you take that in consideration. Last one is um, leverage data as a strategic asset. Uh, I always said when I was in the government that uh, uh, next to the workforce, uh, data was the most important asset that we had I think a lot of this stuff can, everything else can really be reconstituted, but uh, you need to build a data strategy, one that emphasizes the, the value proposition, the vision, guiding principles, and specific objectives, 
but create a data architecture that optimizes the value of your data across the enterprise, build a data investment plan uh, or implementation plan with details, and you're going to be uh, managing data across a, a hybrid cloud environment. And you can do that very effectively through data virtualization. Uh, so those are the really the, the key, five key imperatives, uh, Jason, that I see that are out there for, for CIOs in the federal space. Joe, there's a lot to unpack there. Let me just offer, we'll go into one of those a little more in, in more detail. I want to go all the way back to number one, manage IT as a business. You, you mentioned the 80% uh, o and M versus DME, some, a number we've heard quite often. And uh, I always like to kind of poke our friends at OMB to remind them to put that back on the website because they, they for some reason, took it down. But I'm wondering if the pandemic is, is going to really shift that number for the first time in years. Would you say we're going to see that number shift closer to 70% or even 65% in some cases because of the urgency and the requirements needed to deal with the pandemic? There, um, There's a new category out there that uh, I think may be changing that uh, and that's called provisioning and that's uh, essentially the work that is being done in the cloud because you think about it a cloud is a combination of o m and, and dm and &E. uh, you'd like to believe that your cloud service providers are are actually maintaining that environment and they are and so um it's hard to break out at least i could had a hard time how, before the provisioning category how do I characterize my cloud spend? And OMB has created a, a another third category called provisioning. And I think what you'll see there is that um, as we move more and more to the cloud, more, more spend will actually occur in that provisioning category. And um, that will that, that'll come out of the OM. And I think every CIO out there has seen the, the value that uh, cloud services and moving. Uh, cloud services to the cloud, or uh, moving services to the cloud, has resulted, in, or you know, in the pandemic. I mean, they've been able to support uh, remote users through uh, robust cloud services, scale those very quickly. Uh, I don't think you're going to see the DM&E um, number change a whole lot. I mean, that's typically been 18 to 20 percent, and I think that's going to stay there uh, for for number, well, probably number of years. You bring up cloud, that's another one of the areas that, that you talked about moving as much as possible to the cloud. And then obviously the pieces and parts of that, the automation. Walk me through a little bit of the hybrid cloud strategy that we're seeing. A lot of agencies are gonna have to remain on-prem. I know at Justice, you had that hybrid cloud strategy as well. Well, I think, um, look, a hybrid cloud environment, when I say hybrid cloud, I'm talking about on-prem, private, third-party cloud services. Um, the bottom line on this is that that provides you the, the most flexibility and agility of any cloud solution out there. Um, I think the hybrid cloud model is foundational to uh, achieve meaningful digital innovation. Uh, it's, an, it's, it's really an inevitable for any large enterprise. And I would say that uh, if CEOs are saying it's not happening or they're not going down that path because they want to be um, they want to consolidate all of their cloud environment to, to one environment. Um, honestly, I mean, I think cl hybrid cloud is happening, whether it's planned or not. I think it, it ideally is done with a management framework that's desirable, that's helping to facilitate uh, the ideal implementation. Um, but it allows you to go from idea to production at speed, at scale, um, gives you the greatest agility, flexibility, and resiliency. I mean, we would like to believe that all of the major cloud service providers are, are um, you know, they've, they've secured everything possible. But if the, by chance there's some, somebody has an issue, have been in different cloud environments uh, gives you that resiliency that you wouldn't get being in only one cloud environment. Um, I would say it also allows tailoring to fit a variety of needs within an organization it has uh, greater elasticity and on-demand provisioning. And, you know, Jason, in the past, um, if you wanted to operate on the data across, you know, across these different cloud platforms, you had to bring it together, build a data warehouse. Today, that's not so. With, with cutting te edge technology, uh, you know, data virtualization, you can operate with the, the data staying in its uh, cloud environment. So, 
there's really uh, no downside, all upside to operating in a hybrid cloud environment. And things, you know, services like containers, technologies like containers, those things have really pushed um, operating in a, in a hybrid cloud environment. And I think you're going to see much more use of containers over and replacing virtual machines. The containers piece in the hybrid cloud also takes us back to another imperative, which is the low code, no code environment that you mentioned. Walk me through that. This is something I'm starting to see gain a little bit of traction or, or discussion in government. And I always like it when you know vendors are talking about it and then the government starts to catch up. We saw that with things like zero trust and you saw that with identity and access management. Is, is Are you starting to hear more, if you will, discussion from your uh, federal clients, from your federal partners about low code, no code? Oh, absolutely. It's one of the things that's uh, in the most demand right now is uh, low code, no code, uh, because everybody wants to go fast. And uh, that is one of the, the, the fastest ways to uh, essentially automate. And I mentioned automate, automate. Um, all these services, all these uh, functions that uh, you don't have staff to, to perform, nobody wants to perform their uh, um there's a lot of repetition involved there. Uh, your information is, is pretty accurate. Um, those are great opportunities to, to automate uh, with uh, uh, low code, no code um, you know, platforms. Uh, just to circle back a little bit, um, you know, virtual machines, they're still really popular and there's, there's obviously a place for those, but they operate with their own operating system, middleware applications, essentially they are their own computers, um, and you can have multiple VMs running on the same hardware. But when you look at containers, they're oper you know, operating system specific, and they're sharing the system's libraries. So they use less memory, um, they're, they're more modular, scalable, um, and they're used in conjunction with small independent processor, processors, processes uh, that create microservices. And these microservices form complex applications. And when you look at it, they can be dropped in, these microservices can be dropped in containers and they can run in different cloud environments. So um, there's just a lot of advantages uh, to um, uh, hybrid cloud models, running containers to build microservices. Um, and these can support low code, no code kinds of autom automation. Uh, and it, in today's, world, I mean, you have to go fast. Um, everybody's expecting that. And uh, the technology is out there to allow you to go incredibly fast. I think that's one of the things we saw with the pandemic specifically is the ability to go fast, the need to go fast, that sense of urgency that, you know, uh, when I've talked to others, you really don't see. And, and do you think that's what's driving a lot, a lot of these new imperatives? This, hey, we did this pretty well. We were very successful during the pandemic. How can we I'm going to use it, lift and shift those processes, that experience into the future. Well, when you look at it, there's a lot of different uh, uh, ways to, to transform, right? I mean, um, the I did a lot, when I was at Justice, I did a lot of um, lifting and shifting. I closed 100 data centers and, and saved a lot of money. But I think digital um, leaders are certainly investing heavily in the cloud, but lift and shift today is not, not enough. Um, when you think about the opportunities there, there's rehosting or lifting and shifting model. There's refactoring, which is minimal um, alteration of the application for the cloud. There's re-architecting and that's taking these monolithic applications that maybe have been around for 20 or 30 years and re-architecting them according to, you know, using the microservices we were just talking about and containerizing them. Or you can uh, rebuild, uh, essentially write new code. And you would do this as a cloud native application. Um, you know, and then, then replace, you could replace with a more nimble cloud-based solution. Uh, clearly, um, lifting and shifting gets you, save, can save you a lot of money, but it doesn't give you the performance increase that you really need. So my take would be re-architecting at the very least, or re rebuilding. Yeah, I think a lot of agencies are starting to see and move in that direction. Joe, let's take a quick break. When we come back, we can continue our conversation. You're listening to the discussion, Modern Government, 
How COVID-19 Changed the Course of Digital Transformation, sponsored by KPMG on Federal News Network.